Hi everyone, and welcome to NCARB Live. Today we're going to talk about architecture career tips. I'm Jenny Kowecki, and I'm joined today by two experts in professional development. Amber Hamilton, the Director of Human Resources at Perkins & Wills Atlanta Studio, and Jeremy Fretz, the Assistant Vice President of Experience and Education here at NCARB. Thank you both for joining us today. So whether you're a student looking for your first internship or you're well into the licensure process, we're here to answer your questions about a career in architecture. So you can submit your questions at any time using the chat tool on your screen. And if you have to stop watching, you can always watch a recording later on our blog or YouTube channel. So before we get started, can you both tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you do? Amber, why don't you start? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amber Hamilton, and I'm the Director of uh, Human Resources for Perkins & Wells Atlanta in Miami Studios. I'm also an Associate Principal at the firm, and I started at Perkins & Well in 2003 and have about 20 years of experience uh, within the HR field and about 15 of those within the AEC industry. Uh, my role at, at uh, Perkins & Well really is to work with our leadership teams to set the HR strategy for my studios. Um, and also, in particular for you all, I do a lot with onboarding, recruiting, um, talent development, and learning and development for, for our staff. So I'm really happy to be here, so thank you all for having me. Great. Jeremy? I'm Jeremy Fretz. Uh, I am the Assistant Vice President for Experience and Education here at NCARB, and I am an architect as well. Uh, our Experience and Education group uh, works with the Architectural Experience Program, we work with Continuing Education, and we collaborate with universities and, and, uh, and even with uh, high schools uh, on promoting the career of architecture and just filling in the blanks in what you need to become uh, a competent architect and to remain one. Uh, I also, as I said, I'm in have come from practice. Uh, I've worked for 22 years. I'm licensed in Virginia and Indiana and uh, have practiced and worked across 13 different states. And uh, last but not least, I thought that there was room for, uh, for improvement in architecture, that, that it would be a lot of fun to help architects get better at what they do. And so I pursued a graduate degree in human resource development and am now here uh, getting to do just that and help you and help the profession at large improve. Well, great, we're so glad you're both here to share your expertise. So, as we wait for some questions to roll in from the audience, Amber, can you tell us about some of the qualities you look for in candidates at your firm? Great, um, of course. So, uh, at Perkins & Well, we look for people who are well-rounded. Uh, we look for people who are creative and can kind of think outside the box. Uh, we look for people who can clearly explain their process when they're talking through solving a design solution. Um, especially if you're an entry-level candidate, we're not really looking for someone who comes to the table with a lot of experience, although internships are a great, great resume builder. Um, but we do look for people who really are creative. And when we're, when we're interviewing people, we're always thinking about how you're going to fit into our culture, how you're going to fit and interact with our teams, and how, we might, how you might uh, react in front of a client. So keep all those things in mind uh, when you're coming to the interview. Um, and we also talked a little bit earlier just about the uh, interviewing process. And when you're interviewing with someone, it really is an opportunity for you to interview the firm as well as for them to interview you. So come prepared with questions, thoughtful questions uh, that shows that you've done your research. Great. And Jeremy, do you, what are some questions you think licensure candidates can ask as they look for firms that will help support them in the process of becoming an architect? Sure. One real easy one is to ask, uh, something like, now who will be my AXP supervisor when I'm working here? Uh, or, you know, um, you know, how, do you have any other uh, people who are currently, you know, in the AXP program who are taking tests? You can ask sort of about what the culture is at the office at the, at the time. And I think that's a nice, gentle way to tease out those facts that you're looking for about your, the support uh, that, you, that you'd get. Um, and I will add, I will emphasize on what you said a moment ago about the um, about the sort of two way dynamic of the of the interview process. I heard that from uh, a lot of other hiring professionals as well. That that really shows that you've done your homework, that you know something about the firm, that you know something about what you want to be doing, and uh, it's really helpful. Great. Thanks. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we're going to start taking questions from our audience now. Um, and remember, you can submit your questions at any time using the chat tool. So our first question comes from Nathaniel. Would firms be more likely to hire someone if they have started their exams already? Um, so I'll, <laughs> I'll take that. Um, so that's not necessarily um, a uh, determining factor whether or not we would hire someone. 
Of course, every firm and every major firm you're talking to is really does want you to become a licensed architect um, because that's important for the firm and important for you. So I do think it's important. Um, what we found over the course of my 15 years at Perkins and Will, um, the sooner you get to that process, the better before life gets in the way. Um, but it's always a good idea to get started as early as you can after you've completed those AXP hours. But it's not necessarily determining factor as to whether or not we'll hire you. As long as you have the intent on taking those exams, that's a good thing. And I think there is a, a converse to that, though. If you have been working for a long time and you haven't started taking the exams, that starts to raise questions, right? Yes. You know, why, and, and it might come up in your interview, you know, now you've, you've worked somewhere for 10 years. Why haven't you, uh, have you started your AXP? Have you started taking an exam yet? Um, that will raise questions. Great. Our next question is from Kelsey. She says, I'm a few years out of school, but the mentorship at my current job isn't great. Do you have any suggestions on how to start those conversations? So I would think that um, you know, if your mentorship is not currently great at your firm, if you could talk with, you, it's always in your best interest to tell people what your goals and aspirations are. It's always great to speak up about, um, about your own career and career path and what you want to get out of an, uh, a particular position. So I do think it's, it's uh, worth it for you to make it known, uh, make it known to HR, make it known to operations, make it known to that uh, mentor that you have, what your goals are. I think people kind of need to take a hold of their career and, and make sure that they're actually articulating what their aspirations are. I want to okay. clarify a couple of terms, though, because sometimes they get used interchangeably and, and sometimes they actually, they, it does matter. Um, if you are uh, you know, the, for your AXP program, you have what's called a supervisor, and that's the person who's observing you work, that you don't have a lot of choice in who that is. But in, in terms of an actual mentor, you can choose someone else. It can be someone in your firm. It can be someone in another firm, uh, you know, you, that you can find if your supervisor isn't providing you with the kind of support that you, you want, or if you feel like you just don't connect with them, you can also go out and find somebody else to be your mentor and to guide you in that through your career process. And we you know, encourage you to do that. All right. So next question is from Tara. And I think this one is probably a Jeremy question. How do you define lawful architecture practice? And I think that's referring to the experience settings under the AXP. Um, I'm Glad somebody else asked me that question last week because I know the answer. Um, I'm, I'm new here, so seven months in, some of these questions could be uh, could be tricky. But the the answer is actually defined at a state level. So you actually have to find out how the lawful practice of architecture is defined in your state or juris U.S. jurisdiction, uh, and that might vary slightly. So it, it's really a state by state question. Okay. And our next question is from Audrey. She says, with more than six years of experience, do I still need a portfolio to apply to a new job as a project manager? And a follow-up, how do you, do you suggest displaying professional work in a portfolio? That's a really good question. And I'll answer it by saying, I think you always should have a portfolio of your work, whether you're applying for a position as a project manager or a project designer. Um, what we ask for at Perkins and Will is also to see your schoolwork. Um, even though you're six years in, it's helpful for us to see your school portfolio because when you're in school, it allows you a little bit more opportunity to be creative in a way that you may not be with clients and budgets um, as you're six years into your career. So I do think a portfolio is a great idea. Um, it, your portfolio is really a representation of you um, in terms of what you're actually displaying to, um, to your, uh, the potential employer. And your portfolio really should have process. Um, so we want to understand your process and how you come to a design solution. So that's what we do in every, that's the questions that we're asking. Um, and your process really should speak for itself. So an employer should be able to tell what your process is without you having to explain it, but you should always be able to explain your process well in the interviewing process. Jenny, am I allowed to ask follow-up questions? <laughs> sure. Amber, when, when I was in school, the, uh, my portfolio was this document we spent a semester preparing. It had to have examples of everything that we had done in the entire program, and it was an odd size. Now, are any of those things appropriate today? <laughs> well, what I would tell you is most of the time when we see, see uh, portfolios today, um, first, anything is appropriate as long as it's reflective of you. Um, but what we see most often today is we see either um, digital portfolios or we see hard copy portfolios. Um, I've seen everything from index cards, 
sort of like index cards that people explain and lay out on a table and explain. I've seen bound copies of books. Um, I've seen magazines um, as uh, portfolios. It really is about what's unique and particular to you. I would encourage you when you're coming into an interview to always bring a hard copy as well as your digital copy. Um, sometimes when you come to an employer's office, you may not be able to connect or there's something wrong with the Wi-Fi. Um, and if you can't pull up your portfolio, then there's a lot of uh, angst on your part um, and a lot of kind of time spent trying to, uh, to work through that process. So I would just encourage you to bring both forms, both, uh, both uh, copies um, of, of uh, whatever medium you have. Loved what you said about showing process um, because that, as you're flipping through, you can see a pretty picture. But if there's something there that helps you understand what led to that pretty picture, that helps a, a great deal and demonstrates the thinking skills that the firm is looking for. Absolutely. Um, I've heard other um, hiring managers also recommend things like a format that is printable, so that you know if you're if you you know if you are sending somebody a PDF, that it be printable. Um, because they might take it, print it out and take it home at the end of the day. And I've also heard them say you've got about three seconds to make an impression with your, uh, with your resume and you know, a page of your portfolio. So really focus on your best work. That's right. All right. Our next question is from Nessa. How do you find a mentor outside of the firm you are working in if you're looking for more honest feedback and advice? I would say network. It's always about building your networks. Um, go to uh, AIA events, um, become an you know, get involved with the Associate AIA program. Um, there are lots of opportunities um, for people in the architecture industry who are right out of school. I think you really have to start understanding who's out there and who's in the network. Do your research. Look and see who's publishing. If there's someone that you're really interested, who's published a great article that really intrigues you, Get out there and meet them. Talk to them. Um, you know, it's never too early to start building your network. I'll add, uh, coming back to the idea of the uh, the mentorship piece, I have a, a story that I like to tell about a, a friend of mine who worked with me at a firm, and you know, we did the big multifamily housing, and he had. Um, and he got a nice, nice enough paycheck from us, but he also built a relationship with a boutique designer here in DC. And so his mentor, you know, someone who, who couldn't hire him and probably wouldn't pay him well if he could hire him, um, was, you know, but he got this great mentorship experience with a really brilliant, renowned designer because he asked, because he was willing to ask. That's right. And I'll, I'll just add to that and say, you know, what you find with architects and designers, a lot of people want to share, they want to give back. So never be afraid to ask. Um, they can only say no, but I think for the most part, you'll find that people are really going to be, uh, they want to give back to you because someone gave back to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next question is from Carly. What are some specific interview no-nos, either specific to architecture or just in general? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, interview no-nos. Um, I would say never come to an interview unprepared. Um, in terms of not having done your research. And when I say do, do your research, I also mean do a little bit more in-depth research. So don't ask questions that are just easy to find on your website. Um, ask questions that are a little more thoughtful. Do research on LinkedIn. Find out about the people that you're interviewing with. So always come prepared um, and always dress for the interview. Um, so I think in a design firm, you can be a little more edgy, um, but always come at, in a way that is presentable um, and uh, that you feel comfortable in that respect. All right. Um, Catherine would like to know, how do you balance personal ethics within the architecture field? For example, if you feel strongly on a topic, but the project you're asked to work on goes against your values. I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be pondering. You, you start. Sure. Um, that's a really good question. Um, and I do think that it's really important that if there is a project that you're being asked to work on, that you, you speak up um, if it goes against kind of of uh, what you think and what you believe. Um, you know, at Perkins Well, there's some, there are, of course, there are projects that come up that maybe people don't think are the right projects for them. It is about personal choice um, in some respects, so you just have to talk to the people that you're working with and make your beliefs and your, and your goals known. Yeah, I think there's, there's a couple of ways to, the things that might be, might or might not be implied in that question, and then that is, you know, is it unethical in a larger sense that it's unethical within the profession or within uh, compliance with laws? And you know, and that's one case where I think you, you know, you have to 
make the ethical call to walk away and to sort of say, you know, this is in violation of something. I, we shouldn't be That's doing right. this. And, and it may, you know, you might find yourself in a position where you need to walk mm -hmm. away, literally. Uh, but if it's something that's more of a personal ethic, um, say, for example, sustainability or um, the, something about the client and the client's business, what the kind of work they're doing. Um, you know, I, I heard somebody talking a lot about um, the huge, <laughs> the huge number of buildings that are being built for cannabis production. That's a big deal right now in the architecture world in some parts of the country. Um, you know, so those more personal ethics uh, is something where you'd want to talk to your manager, and hopefully they can find, you know, help you find a way around it, find another project you can work on. Um, but if you know, if you're and that, and that may be, be a case where you choose to walk away if that's the only kind of project they're doing. Sure. And I would uh, piggyback on that and, that and just say that, you know, do your research before you start working for a firm. Make sure that their overall goals and values are actually representative of, of your personal goals and values as well. So there may be a project that comes up, as you were mentioning, and, and I was talking more about personal ethics uh, in mm -hmm. my first um, response. But if you are... Um, you know, being asked to do something, just make sure that you're, you're talking to people. And, and for the most part, I think most firms are not going to ask you to work on a project that completely is against right. your personal beliefs. Right. Okay. On a slightly lighter topic, Gogo asks, how likely is it that you would hire someone capable of doing the job but who doesn't have a referral? Um, you mean, uh, assuming that you mean a referral from uh, another employee or from the, within the industry, I think we... Are always it's all about the individual and it's all always about what you bring to the table um, in terms of your skill sets and your knowledge and the best fit for the role so um, we'd always uh, we're always looking for talent and we're going to hire the best talent whether or not they have a referral um, or have previous work experience I think you're the, there you would I'm, I'm gonna read into the question and assume that it's a professional referral but you could also hopefully have a you know someone who's able to vouch for your character um, which would, would be um, welcome. Okay. Andalman Andal asks, what's the best way to beat around the bush and not say something negative when an interviewer asks you why you want to leave your current job? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> um, you all are throwing us some great Do you feel like you're being topics. interviewed today? I do, I do. <laughs> um, I, think, um, I think you can always talk about growth opportunity. So for the most part, I think when people are um, interviewing for a position, a lot of times it's about growth. Um, what I would advise is you never really want to say anything negative about the current employer you're working for. Um, and if you are so unhappy um, and that that comes across in the interview, it doesn't fare well on the employer who's interviewing you. So always think for look at the, the positives and talk about what you've gained from that experience, but maybe there's a new growth opportunity for mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really good answer. Um, you know, you just say, you know, while I've been doing this kind of work and I want to, I'd like to do something different or, um, you know, I want to, there's any number of things like that you could come up with that, that are reasons that you, uh, that you want to change that's positive and that isn't because I'm miserable there. <laughs> right. Okay. Dahlia asks, would you recommend bringing something other than a portfolio to an interview? And I assume that's in addition to your portfolio. Um, I would always recommend bringing extra copies of your resume. Uh, it never hurts um, to have those ready, uh, your cover letter. If you have anything else that you think is representative of you, um, one piece that I didn't mention in your portfolio um, that we always look for at Perkins Will, and that's if you have any personal talents um, in terms of watercolors or drawing, sketching skills. Um, I encourage people to include those in your portfolio if they're not in your portfolio. Bring them with you. We love to see that because it shows a creative side of you that we uh, may not uh, gather from renderings or from um, some of the process information that's in your uh, portfolio already. Yeah, and I've heard others talk about the value of bringing perhaps um, maybe not a, you know if you've if you have a little bit more experience and you've worked on a set of good set of construction drawings and you have a half size set of those available to you. Um, then you know you might be able to bring that and talk through um, talk through the, the pieces of the work that are yours. That's a really good point. Okay. Next is a question from Alvin. After, say, five to ten years of experience and career progress, what would you say is more important, your resume, your portfolio, or references? How, how far is he? How many yes. years? Um, six specifically. Okay. I updated it to five to ten. Okay, five to ten. <laughs> you want to... So, um, what I... <laughs> 
<laughs> they're all important. Um, but I do think it's really, you know, five to 10 years of experience. It's about the experience that you've had working um, within the profession at that point. So, you know, if you've worked for a competitor or if you have experience on a particular project type, um, it really does also depends on the position that you're applying for. So if you have a lot of experience um, working on one project type um, and you are interested in, in uh, doing something totally different or working on a new project, um, then you know, it's really helpful for you to be able to explain in your resume kind of why you want to pursue a new project type. I would say, um, what tells your story? Uh, what is the story you want to tell and what best tells that story? Um, you know, you might have a lot of portfolio pieces on a project type you don't want to work on. So what is the what is the piece in your portfolio or your resume or your experience or your extracurricular activities that tells that story? And then what are the graphic representations that help support that? Okay. Our next question is from Jason. How do you approach the conversation about salary and position within the firm after you complete the exam and get licensed? I think it's always important to um, approach that conversation first with your manager, um, sharing with them your goals, um, your aspirations. Uh, it should be an open dialogue. Um, so you can also always talk with, um, with HR, with, <coughs> with the management team in your office, but <coughs> excuse me. But I do think it's important to have the conversation, um, to bring it up, to talk about why you feel like you need a uh, compensation adjustment at that time. Um, and you may or may not know where other people are in relation to that. At Perkins Well, we give like a licensure bonus. Um, so we have some kind of things in place already to, to help um, after that process. And we, and we pay for all the exams as you pass all the exams. But, um, but we do, uh, you know, you should be encouraged and you should have that. You should be feel free to broach that conversation <clears throat> in an impactful way. Would you, I would, I would hope you also uh, uh, have <coughs> found that out ahead of time. Right, what the right. what the existing standard is, because it's a lot easier to say now. I'm taking my exams. You know, does that result in a in a bonus? You know, when you're even when you know. So if, if the company hasn't made that clear to you what their what their policies are regarding um, paying for exams or um, what that Im does to impact your salary, you know, it's easier to ask that I think ahead of time rather than okay, I've passed the exam. You know, you know now what? Right. I think you should also always be able to demonstrate what your worth is. You know, you should always be able to talk about where you think you are, understanding what those um, surveys and things are mm -hmm. out in the market, understanding your worth, as we talked about before, um, and then also understanding, um, you know, what the uh, other limitations might be from the employer pers uh, perspective in terms of when compensation adjustments are made, but asking those questions and making sure that you feel comfortable with the answers ahead of time. You mentioned when we talked about before, I think that was on our false start. So in case I haven't said it yet, um, you should, we, and apologies for our little delay at the beginning, um, but the, uh, if, you, uh, if you're looking for, you know, what is my worth, uh, the AIA compensation um, survey, it, there's an online tool that you can use to sort of gauge that based on the descriptions uh, of, that are given there. And you should always compare that description very carefully to what you're actually doing in the firm. Um, but uh, that can give you an idea of what that position in your market is, is valued at and what other people are being paid. Okay. Um, our next question is from Sam. How do you show initiative and take more responsibility in the office without undermining your manager or coworkers? Um, <laughs> so, good question. Again, um, so uh, taking initiative, that's really about, um, you know, stepping up. I don't think it's ever seen as undermining your coworkers. I think it's always appreciated when people are stepping up to the plate and taking on some ownership mm -hmm. of different projects or things that you think might be um, necessary in the office or might enhance the culture of the office. Um, I know at Perkins and Will we're always appreciative of people who are you know, taking on new things, um, seeing a need, and then saying, you know what, here's my idea. Let's talk about it. Let's make sure we've got the budget for it, and then let's do it. Um, so I think it's always a good thing to, uh, to step up, to take initiative, um, and you know, do it in a way that you're gaining uh, insights from other people, you're collaborating, you're having discussions, and you're engaging the right people to help make those decisions and move things forward. Yeah, you know, a professional career, you're, you're no longer in a cohort. Uh, you're no longer in a class that moves all moves at the same rate and all has the same 
things that you're doing in your life and your priorities are different. Um, so, you know, step in and do the things that you're interested in and, and uh, create the path that you want within the firm. Okay. Marina asks, I'm currently an IPAL student at Catholic University of America. Would it be useful to my career to try to work in Canada or Mexico and gain international experience? I Sorry, I can take this, but can you, can you read, the, read it again? <laughs> sure. I'm currently an IPAL student mm -hmm. at the Catholic University of America. Would it be useful to my career to try and work in Canada or Mexico to get international experience? And I think she specifically wants to know before she completes her IPAL program. Right. Um, so the international experience, I would just, you know, hopefully you know the, the rules about experience settings and what hours you can count in AXP. Um, so aside from that, making sure that, you know, you're, that you're able to count those um, international setting O hours working under a, um, a licensed professional in the other country or if there happens to be a US licensed architect in that other country that's great for your AXP hours. Um, so aside from that I think you know any opportunity to travel abroad to work abroad actually increases your experience um, and I would get, say looks you know good on a resume wouldn't you? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think the most experience you can gain, um, especially coming right out of school, anything that sets you apart from your competition is always a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next question is from Eddie, who's trying to broaden their range in learning and decision making. making. He says, well, I've been interning in different sections of architecture, for example, residential and commercial. What other ways can he get his feet wet? I could I could spend all night talking about this and coming and brainstorming with you. Uh, it would be a lot of fun. Um, but the I think you can I would look at at so assuming you're going to stay at your current job because you like it and they like you. Um, I think you would look to select some mentors outside, some people you can go meet. I think you could go to AIA conferences or other conferences, um, broaden to and, and in fact, you know perhaps look at some of the the other. Um, parallel organizations. Look at CSI, Construction Specifications Institute. Look at the Urban Lands Institute. Look at the Congress for New Urbanism. Um, there are all sorts of places where you can meet people that are outside your current circle and learn about what they're doing. Uh, and I think that would, would give you some, some great ex exposure. Now, I was just going to say, I agree with that. I also think it's a great idea to set up interviews with those people. Um, if you see someone who is uh, doing something that you're really interested in or you're curious about how they got down to the path that they are taking now and where they are in their profession, then ask the questions. Um, people are usually more than willing to share their experiences if you ask the question. So set up those interviews and, and talk with them. Okay. And a reminder to our viewers, you can submit your questions at any time using the chat tool on your screen, so keep them coming. Um, our next question is from Frank. Does a master degree make one earn more dramatically? And is it worth it to invest $150,000 to go to grad school? And as a follow-up, do you have any suggestions about recovering from that debt? Hmm. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to have an opinion on that. <laughs> Um, so I think overall for, uh, for most of the firms around town, what we want is for you to become a licensed architect. Whether it's a five-year program or a master's program, what we want, because it means more for us um, as a firm to say we've got a certain number of registered architects, it means a different thing to your clients when you start to serve those clients in different roles as you progress through your career. So um, it, it really is up to you. You need to make a personal choice about which program is right for you, um, whether it's that five-year program or if that's, it's that master's program. So um, that's what I would say uh, is probably most important. And I guess the other things is the, uh, that I would bring to it is obviously you want a program that leads you to a professional license um, and one that is broadly accepted if you're going to work in more than one state. Um, so we would want it to be a NAB accredited professional degree, whether that's a five, you know, whether that's a, a bachelor's of architecture or a master's of architecture, um, is up to you. The other piece is, you know, what is the what is the focus of that master's program? Is it something that's that's sort of particular? Does it have a particular network of alumni that it's important to be a part, be connected to? I think those things are what you know more than just the length of the degree and the cost of the degree. I think you have to look at the really do your sort of cost benefit analysis of all right, what does this degree get me um, that's different, and is that worth it? And as for helping you pay off your debt. 
I don't know that we're going to have uh, any brilliant answers on, on that. <laughs> okay. Our next question is from Melissa. How would one ask for a raise that stresses your seniority in the company without comparing yourself to your other coworkers? Well, I'll go back to something I said earlier, and I do think it's always about um, talking about uh, your worth and your contribution. So um, when you go in to have that conversation about compensation, make sure that you understand what questions you want to ask, why you feel you need a compensation adjustment, um, and then I think what, what employers are going to do is they're going to take a look at, at what they do consider to be, you know, your peer group within the office, within the firm, their pay equity things that you need to keep in mind um, when we are reviewing those things. But it is about talking about your, your value, your worth, and the contributions you've made to the organization to date. And I think preparing you for those, uh, we, I mentioned earlier, the AIA compensation survey uh, tool and there are other tools, salary.com, uh, although their numbers I think are a tiny bit inflated compared to the AIA. But most of those have elaborate job descriptions and you're sort of reading through those and having an eye, you know, being sort of giving yourself a self-test. You know, all right, do I do I do these things? Am I Do I have these skills that merit this level of pay? Uh, just being prepared and knowing what you're talking about. Okay. Ashley asks, in this day and age, is it worth staying with one firm for a long period of time, or is it better to get a variety of experience with different firms? I think that's a personal choice. Um, you know, we've got people who've been with Perkins & Well their entire career, um, or people that have recently started and have experiences elsewhere. Um, I always think it's a great idea to work on a lot of different project types um, before you specialize on one project type. Um, we try to allow those opportunities at Perkins Well. The Atlanta studio in particular of Perkins Well has um, all of the different uh, project types and practices and disciplines that Perkins Well offers. So we hope you get that experience within one firm, um, especially if you start with us uh, at the beginning of your career. But it's, now, it's always a personal decision. It really depends on what types of projects. And you know, to take a step back and look and make sure that you're working for a firm that shares your values, that continues to appreciate you, um, and that is allowing you the opportunity for growth. I think there is, you know, getting diverse experiences is good. And there are a variety of ways to do that. You can do it by going to different firms. Um, and you can do it um, by, you know, as I mentioned earlier, going to conferences, doing, you know, finding ways to sort of give yourself an externship, you know, to go out and to, to be exposed to other things. Um, but you, the one thing you have to be careful of if you are going to be jumping from firm to firm is that if you do that too much, that starts to look bad on your resume. And people, you know, people who are in hiring positions are saying, okay, why did they keep leaving? And you know they might think that it's something other than oh I just want a different experience, and they're going to question, you know, will you stay here long enough to finish a project? Um, so just be a little bit cautious about that. Right. And I'll just uh, to tag onto that, um, I would encourage you all to make sure you know your story when you're going into the um, the process of reviewing your resumes because employers will ask um, and. As Jeremy was just saying, um, short stints on your resume do raise a bit of an HR red, red flag, but if there's a good reason for why you left an organization, then that has a different story. Or perhaps it's relocation. I mean, you just make sure that you know your story going into it. Mm -hmm. I, I would encourage someone who's just starting out um, to try and find a way to have an experience in a small firm and a big firm. I think that's um, an important exposure uh, to get. I'll agree with that. Okay. Related to the topic of getting a variety of experience, if a candidate's having trouble earning hours in a few AXP areas because their supervisor can't, can't or won't assign them new mm. tasks, do you have any advice on, on getting those hours that they need? Yes. Uh, I think, you know, the, obviously the first line of defense is you want to have that conversation with your supervisor. Uh, and, and, you know, assuming that you've already done that, I think, in this question. Um, then if it's a, a big enough organization, you can take that to the next level and go to their supervisor and say, I really need to get this exposure or to a principal or to an HR department uh, person. If you're in, in an organization that has a human resources department, they will be able to help you, help guide you through who you should talk to and, you know, and they will probably make sure that it happens. Um, the, uh, and, and you know, if none of that works and you're not getting the uh, exposure, the, your supervisor is actually 
violating the AIA code of ethics and they're violating the the agreement you know that, that they sort of sign on to when they become an AXP supervisor now going and telling them that they're violating these agreements probably isn't going to work uh, so you should probably find a way to move on anything to add? I don't really have anything to add except that always making sure your goals and your aspirations are known and as you said raising it to the next level if you're in a firm that um, is large enough to have HR and operations because I do think you need to take ownership of your career. What we always tell people is we don't see all your AXP hours all the time. And so you need to raise your hand and say, you know what, I need to get yeah. some CA experience or, or whatever the experience is that you need. So make sure you're taking ownership of it. Yeah, definitely be proactive and say, uh, you know, this is what I need. Look at the task areas that you need exposure to and make sure that you're asking, you're communicating that clearly. But with this question, we sort of presumed that that was happening and they still weren't getting them, so. All right, well, do you have any advice on advocating for better equity and inclusion at your firm? Um, so I'll take that one. And um, so, you know, diverse, Perkins Will has a diversity, inclusion, and engagement um, initiative. And it really started out as um, an opportunity for us as a firm just to do better. It started out of, you know, a few people saying, hey, we need to, we need to think about things differently. Um, and in order to advocate for equity, inclusion, diversity at your firm, it's about taking those small steps and how are you making the small impacts um, on your community, um, whether it's you know, doing a program for underprivileged youth to expose them to the architecture industry, to um, having conversations about pay equity in your firm. I think just making those small steps, um, taking those small steps and doing what you can do to make an impact and engaging the right conversations with the right people um, to share your interests and your um, and your uh, desires for for moving that forward. I think you can also there are, are now some really great resources available um, to help facilitate the conversation and to help encourage you. Uh, the AIA now has their guides to equi equitable practice uh, as well as the code of ethics, and those are great resources for you to familiarize yourself with um, and you know know what know. Uh, the kind of language that's used and the kind of conversations you know that you can have uh, those resources will make you an expert and a very helpful person uh, in facilitating those conversations okay um, Ade asks and I'm tweaking this question just a little for uh, the purpose of a wider audience um, as an international licensed architect that's practiced for 10 years who just became eligible for, for an architect path for NCARB do you have any suggestions on finding a firm that will support international um, individuals or foreign applicants who are working to complete the AXP in the United States? Okay. Uh, I can take that. <laughs> okay, I can take that. Um, I think that you know the, the, the biggest challenge right now, and I don't know if this is implied in your question or not, one of the biggest challenges is visas, right? Um, whether or not you're, you, are, you have a visa that allows you to work or if you require an employer that will sponsor a visa for you. I've known lots of architecture firms in the past who have uh, been more than happy to support H-1B visas for people. Um, right at the moment, the latest information that I've heard is that it's become dramatically more difficult to get H-1B visas. Um, and so um, uh, that's unfor the unfortunate reality we live in. But assuming that you have, um, that you have a visa or have access to a visa or can get one uh, through your firm, uh, my experience has been that ar the architectural community is actually very receptive to, um, to foreign educated uh, architects and foreign licensed architects. And I'll, I'll agree with that. I mean, you know, it, it really is just dependent upon your personal situation in terms of your eligible, eligibility to work in the U.S. Um, I also encourage people just to understand what that process is. Um, I think I've, I've been approached by many international applicants um, who may or may not really understand the process in the U.S. of obtaining those visas, those mm -hmm. work visas. So I think it's really, it behooves you to really understand, to know what your options are. Um, and then, uh, you know, we can, we can certainly have a conversation about if it makes sense for um, for you to be able to work in the U.S. Right, and one thing I do want to mention because this uh, I've been told that this sometimes happens with with uh, particularly with international students is maybe the culture or country that they're coming from. It's still common for there to be unpaid internships, um, and that is not um, an accepted practice in the United States. Uh, so you know, if you or your friends are being are having unpaid internships as an international student, um, you know 
don't do that. <laughs> uh, you, if you're working and, and delivering value to your employer that they're billing for, you should be paid. Okay. Ralphie asks, how do you know if you're being subjected to unequal pay and how can you ask for better salary transparency? Uh, that's a really good question, again. Um, so I think you have to have the conversations. Um, and again, I can only speak really from my experience, um, but at Perkins Law, I was the, uh, in partnership with our chief HR officer, um, town, chief talent officer, and, and uh, external consultant. We actually went through a pay equity exercise, um, which was really great. Um, we identified pay-related factors. We had lots of conversations um, around uh, the country with all the managing directors and operations directors, so we really tried to elevate um, the concept of, of pay equity and making sure that we are providing equal pay um, for equal work. Um, so, you know, I think you, you have to start the conversation, um, understand what your firm's values are, understand where your firm's take is on pay equity, and if you have an HR department, broach the question, um, talk with the people who might have uh, insight into that particular topic um, to, to begin the conversation. Okay. Um, Jason asks, is there an advantage if you have someone who has an architectural license as well as a PE? And I'm assuming PE is professional engineer. Um, what I would say to that is it always um, helps if you have a wide variety of experiences. Um, so we do look for people who have dual degrees. Um, I, Engineering and architecture is not ones that we typically common, we commonly see at Perkins and Well together necessarily um, because we don't have um, you know, engineering in-house. However, we do see a lot of architects or, and landscape architecture degrees or architecture and interior design degrees or architecture and urban design degrees or a combination thereof. Um, so I think the, the more um, well-rounded your educational experience is, the better it will um, make you in terms of working, specifically working for a firm with um, an integrated practice uh, that like Perkins and Well um, and some of the other larger firms. I think the, uh, it's an interesting question and, and the, the real question is, are you looking for increased value of your paycheck or just the increased opportunities that it opens you to? Um, I think, you know, are you going to, because you have two degrees and two professional licenses, are you going to get twice the salary? Probably not. Um, but the, um, but it opens you to a world of being a better architect or being a better engineer and knowing how to better communicate across those disciplines. Uh, it opens you to more career possibilities in the future. Um, in, in, you know, it makes you very portable, but whether or not that's really worth the cost of the two degrees and the two licenses is a whole different question. Okay. And, um, I, and I know people that have done it, by the way. Um, <laughs> Our next question is from Dahlia, who had their first internship this past summer. Should I stick with this firm next summer as I was invited back, or should I look for a new opportunity? I'll get back to saying I think that's a, a personal decision. I do think you, um, during the internship process, it's a great idea, specifically, um, as Jeremy was just saying, to get an uh, experience at a large firm or a small firm. So it's never a bad idea to expand your internship experiences. Um, but if you've gotten a, you had a really great experience, you think you can have a different or a new opportunity with the same firm, uh, and you really enjoy the relationships that you've started to build, it, it, you know, it's a great idea to go back if, if mm -hmm. that's really the right fit for you. Okay. Dominic asks, what's the typical salary range for an architectural graduate with two years of experience? I suspect the answer is it varies. <laughs> that would be the right mm -hmm. answer. <laughs> So the best way to get to your answer to that question is to go to that aforementioned AIA salary uh, survey website uh, and click the corresponding category for uh, architect with you know that much experience. I think it's called architect one still, um, but you're architect one or two, uh, and you know put in the I think it get, lets you also put in the location you're in and find out. There are definitely cost of living differences, so make sure that you understand the market that you're looking at. Yeah. Okay. I think we have time for a few more questions. So if you have any last minute questions, just keep them in the chat box. And um, so our next question is, my supervisor takes a few months to review my AXP reports. What should I do? <laughs> 
So again, this is one of those where there is an ethical consideration. Uh, the AIA Code of Ethics actually speaks to this, that supervisors should be responding in a timely manner um, went to candidates they're supporting. Um, but the, so, so that's the very high-minded answer. So the practical side of that is you should uh, ask them to see if they can, can do it more quickly. Uh, and back to the same path that I, I said earlier, if they're not amenable to that, then you might have to start talking to HR or to someone else. Right. Okay. Um, our next question is, my firm doesn't help pay for ARE divisions or other licensure costs. How can I ask for some of those benefits? Um, I think you uh, you can ask the question, but I really think you should know going into uh, to working for an organization. Um, I think for the most part, most firms do offer to either, um, at least most of the larger firms now, offer to um, pay for the AREs once you pass all of them. Um, some firms give licensure bonuses. Some firms give you time off to study for and take exams. Um, so I think you really ought to do your research before you start working for a firm and really understand what their philosophy is um, kind of before you sign the contract um, to, uh, to be, begin working for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next question is from Deo. As a foreign educated and licensed architect with experience in different design, cultural, and material usage, how does this impact how a potential employer would view my portfolio and internship placement? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, could you repeat that question? Okay. So, I think they are a foreign educated and licensed architect with experience in different cultures and materials. So, how would that impact how an employer would would view them as a candidate for a position? I think is the question. Um, so, I would just go back to saying it's about experience. Um, so, I think uh, employers are looking for people who are well rounded, who have diverse backgrounds. Um, so I think you just need to make sure that you are explaining your, um, your desires and what you would like to work on and what your background is um, in a cover letter, uh, if you're invited for an interview or a phone screen to, um, to have that conversation with your employer about what you're, what you're looking for. So um, I think we're always looking for talent uh, you know, at Perkins Will and again at any other firm that you're talking with. People are looking for talented in individuals, diversity of thought, diversity of background and making sure that you're having the right, that right conversation um, during the interviewing process. In, um, you know, we deal with um, helping foreign architects get licensed in the United States and, and helping them find their path to licensure here. And so I know that there are a lot of differences from country to country. Uh, in some countries, the license is very similar to what we have in the United States. The education is very similar. Um, their license to practice is unlimited as it is here. And, you know, so depending on the country you're coming from, um, that may vary. Uh, for architects license in the U.S., the expectation is that you're trained, even though you may not have worked in different climactic uh, situations, you're trained to be able to research, understand, and respond to any climate and any building construction type. You may not have the experience, but you can, you know how to dig into it and how to get the knowledge that you need. You know the questions to ask. Um, so I think demonstrating that you have those traits will overcome any. Um, any barrier uh, otherwise. Okay, so I think for our final question today, if you are currently testing and working toward getting licensed, would you recommend to stay at the same firm until you are licensed? Or is it a problem to relocate and work at another firm? I would say that really again, and I hate to keep saying it's a personal decision, <laughs> but it really is. It, it is up to you um, what you can handle in terms of workload as you're trying to take those tests. Um, uh, we know that those are really tough exams. So is it the right time for you personally to make a shift? Um, you know, starting a new job is a, it can, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy mm -hmm. to learn the people and the practices and what you're supposed to be doing in a new role. Um, but at the same time, if you're not getting the, the opportunities at the current firm you're working for um, and you want to position yourself to be in a better place um, prior to finishing those licensure exams, then um, begin to look and look out elsewhere and seek new opportunities. I think very, from a very practical standpoint, look at look at your rolling clock and where <laughs> where you how much time you how much uh, slack time you have in there to make the to make the transition and where you might not be able to 
uh, test because of those onboarding experiences. And the other thing is if that relocation or change of jobs happens to involve relocation to a different state, um, you know, you can still test in the new state um, and pursue the license in the, the state where you began the process. Uh, so from that standpoint, it's, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, and of course, we have test centers all over the world now. So. Okay. Well, we're almost out of time. So before we sign off, can you each share one key takeaway that you think our viewers should really learn today? Um, I'll start and I'll just say, you know, always be curious, um, ask questions. Um, if you're in the interviewing uh, process, then make sure you're no you are speaking up and you make your um, aspirations known. Um, I jokingly tell uh, all of my employees um, every year when we're talking about career path and development that my husband always tells me, he said, if you don't tell me what you want, I don't know what you want. So <laughs> you have to make sure that you're articulating um, where, you're, where, where you want to go with your career. Um, so talk to people, ask questions, be curious, um, and never be afraid to, uh, to start building your network at a really, even an early age, um, because you never know who you're sitting across the table from now as a peer may one day be a, the CEO and you're calling on them for, um, for a new opportunity or a new project. So. And I would say, uh, just encourage, particularly people who are just out of school, um, you know, you have, for much of your career, you've probably gone, you're, so far, you've, you've gone through a regimented process of some sort. You had to pick a school, and maybe you made some, some significant decisions and internships and things like that. But in a lot of ways, there's been a path that you've been on, and you have just fallen off the path. Um, there's not even a path other than, you know, once you start taking an exam, you've got to complete it in five years. Other than that, there's no path. Um, so it's your turn to make your path, and I would encourage you to think actively about, all right, what now? Um, you know, what, what, is, what is next? Where do I want to be next? Um, and, you know, what do I need to do to start going down that path? Who do I need to know? What experiences do I need to have? You know, what events should I attend? Um, and um, going with that, I would encourage you to seek out people who can, who can guide you along that path. Architecture is not always easy. There will be times when you have something you don't understand from a technical standpoint, or you might, have, um, you might find that you're very s stressed and struggling to deal with something. You know, find the people that can help you. Find, find a mentor, find a, a career coach, or find a, a mental health professional that can really help you succeed and thrive and you know, move to the next step in your career. Okay, well thank you both so much for being here with us today and thank you viewers for sharing your questions. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar and if, for more career tips, you can visit ncarb.org slash blog and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.